as a filmmaker, you should just be aware like of what you're up against and that like these fantastical fantasy outcomes are like so, so unlikely that they should not at all be embedded in your, your, your hopes and dreams for the success of your movie. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a money-making business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome back to the show, returning champion, Alaric Burlsell. How you doing, Alaric? <laughs> Feeling good. Thanks for having me, Alex. I'm like so stoked to be back, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming back on the show, man. I'm, I'm excited to talk about your new film, The Alternate which uh, is, I know, a long gestating project. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, think I mean, you I were- The last time I was on the show, I was like in crowdfunding, like super sweaty, super nervous, just like, please help me make please this help. movie, people. Please, Dear God. <laughs> please help me, please. Oh, so can I have another cup of porridge? It, it happened <laughs> though. So thank well, you, everyone. <laughs> so uh, no, I wanted to have you on the show, uh, not to only talk about your new film, but I think it's a great opportunity to talk about the state of independent film because it changes so rapidly, so often in our business. I mean, yeah, God, I mean, it's from, from the, basically from the nineties on, it's been so eighties on basically, but the nineties on, it's really just changed so much and it seems to be changing faster and faster every, every month. There's something new showing up, some new service coming up, some new way to make money, some way, some new way we're getting screwed uh, by somebody uh, or some company yeah. or something. So there's yeah. always something. So I'd love to hear your opinion on from your point of view and from, you know, obviously you do the interviews on making movies is hard and with Liz and and you guys are, are kind of have on the pulse as well as I am on what's happening in the indie world. So in your opinion, what do you think? Where do you think the state of independent film is, sir? Well, I guess let's like try to define it a little bit better. Like, do you mean like indie film with like anybody, like including like known, well-known filmmakers, like, you know, the Darren Aronofsky's of the world and people who are like making indie film, quote unquote, on their own, but like yeah. have budgets and things. Or are you talking about like the little, you know, people? I'm who talking just... about, I'm t let's just put it this way. How many Darren Aronofsky's are listening to us right now? Right. Exactly. So that yeah. so I don't think sure. And, and, well, it, so, just, it just frustrates me because like you look at fucking IndieWire or whatever or some of these places and they're like indie film and then they just start quoting all these like five million, ten million dollar movies and you're like that's not really what indie film is. Like indie film to me is like million or under, you know, um, and people who are just scraping their budgets together like don't don't necessarily have any, any massive talent. No, no one would know who they are, you know. Like that's kind of where I see like indie film, it's like the movies that like, you know, XYZ is picking up, you know, and like, you know, companies like that, like the smaller and- A24s, yeah, the A24s of the world it, and things yeah, like that. Yeah, barely, although A24 is like, if you get to A24 level, yeah. you're kind of already <laughs> well, no, but, onto the, I mean, I'm, uh, you know? I'm seeing I'm seeing a bunch of the A24 films lately and, and there are some that I have no idea other than the director who the hell they are. So there are right. those, but then there's the, of course, the everything everywhere all at once. Uh, crowd yeah. as well <laughs> but yeah right. but no but, yeah but, little, but that's a very, wilds but, movies and stuff stuff you know it's just like you know book smart yeah etc it's like you know come on i mean like i feel like a24 like maybe they are picking up some stuff that's like you know from these unknown like struggling filmmakers but i think for the most part like if you get on their radar it's like you've kind of ascended to like another scope than mm -hmm. you know the majority of, of indie filmmakers yeah, Another exactly. Sphere, so, I should say. So, no, I think so to, to answer your question, I do think that like the the whale and, and, you know, Darren Aronofsky's film that's coming out and a bunch of other films that, you know, everything everywhere all at once is, quote unquote, an indie film. And and I would say it is because I talked to the boys and they, it, it wasn't it wasn't a five hundred million dollar movie, though. Right. It was basically it was basically the craft service budget of Doctor Strange. And they both <laughs> tackled the, the, the multiverse in a very different way. So I think the state of independent film, I think the artistic state at that level is is going strong. There's still a place for it. It's harder now, yeah. I think, to even be seen than it was five years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, but I'm talking more yeah. about the state of independence, what, like, of like the alternate, like that kind yeah. of film. Well, yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, what I'm seeing is that, you know, you, you really you hustle your ass off to make your movie, you know, and then 
like if you're lucky, you get into like some some really great film festivals, you know. And then if you're like with well, a one percent, you get into like you know South by Southwest or these game changing film festivals that like you know agents and managers are suddenly paying attention to you and you're getting those kinds of offers and then your career is like whatever, you know. But that's like such a small percentage of filmmakers. That's like yeah, like like literally the one percent, you know. And then everyone else, it's like you're basically you're, you get you get into those film festivals. You're trying to get the best absolute distribution deal you possibly can. Um, and then, you know, you get pumped out into until the digital marketplace, most likely. Maybe you get on a streamer. Um, maybe you get on a streamer eventually later down the line in your in the life of your movie. But it's kind of like you're just out in the ether. And that's sort of up to you to, to do the promotion and to get people to watch your movie. Um, and then in that case, if you go with a distributor, it's, you got to like split the profits and everything. But I think... You know, with going with a distributor, you get like a lot of other bonuses, you know, like yeah, they, like they not off. getting paid, like not getting paid and <laughs> and or, no or, reports, you know, <laughs> like like access to a, to a good depends, depends, depends. I mean, you distributor. could probably hire the same PR team that your distributor is hiring, you know, whatever, and do it on your own and pay that money up front. But like having that kind of support and that infrastructure can be helpful. Like we did get a lot of access, um, you know, to different outlets through them and mm -hmm. our uh, our you know, our trailer ended up picking up like, you know, 160,000 plus hits, you know, um, on YouTube kind of through like the work that that team did of like, you know, hitting up all these different channels and like getting the word out on the movie. So I think like to, to some extent, like, unless you want to be like, you know, managing a, a, a PR from yourself uh, and then paying that cost up front, which is like, you know, you already spent all this money making the movie. Like, do you really have another $5,000 to pay a PR team out of your own pocket, you know, when, when you're going to distribute, maybe, maybe you do, you know, if you want to do self-distribution, but I basically feel like, I guess the state of what I'm saying is that, you know, even at the, 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 the highest, like even at like a level of success that is like, like really exciting and acceptable, we're kind of all in the same playing field still, you know, and like, it's like kind of up to the filmmaker to, to get the word out in their movie and to, you know, have it, um, you know, recoup its investment, hopefully. And then if not, like, uh, you know, at least get you onto your next project. So I feel like that's sort of what the first feature I really feel like is, is useful for is like, you know, using that as like, you know, what your short film used to be, like your short film used to be your calling card. Now I feel like your first feature is your calling card, getting those reviews, like, you know, on a Rotten Tomatoes and like getting a Rotten Tomatoes rating, or, you know, at least just getting some positive reviews from some sort of critic it's like that's all ammunition you can use to make your next movie like when you're approaching investors and approaching production companies you can point to your your successes and then that can be like okay well here let now trust me to you know take a little bit more money and go make my next movie, you know so is is the is the first feature in your opinion a loss leader or is there is there some yeah, sort of potential pretty much i mean yeah. I, I mean i feel like there is like some potential but i i think especially as a as a filmmaker like you're definitely not expecting to get any any kind of payment on the first feature you know if you're lucky to get your investors money back but like you as yourself it, like you're not going to get any kind of payment you know? but isn't that but isn't that i mean look i know i know we look at things from the artistic filmmaker insanity carney world that we live in it, it is insane right. i mean there's a delusion that we have ingrained in us at a DNA level to be even in this business. But on a business standpoint, you look at it and you're like, it makes our business is so insane that you right. go out and spend a hundred thousand dollars on, on a product and have no idea truly how to make that money back. Yeah, or, or, if a you make that money, or a million dollars, <laughs> right. you know, hopefully, hopefully if you're at the million dollar stage, you've got a few things in place but to guarantee it, it, something. It, but it seems like a lot of people, even at the million dollar range are kind of oh. in the same boat as, yeah, as the hundred thousand dollar range. It's like, I think when you get to the, to the pre-sale deal and you're like making a deal with a distributor before you make the movie and they're giving you an MG before you even, um, you know, go out and shoot anything. I think that's kind of where like, you, it actually makes a little bit more sense business wise where you're like, not just like, you know, hemorrhaging money into a project um but you know getting those deals isn't easy you know and you it's, have to have it's the right impossible. set yeah. up and everything i mean I, i've seen it done a lot you know and like have people on the show and like talk to other people who like this is what they do um but it's it's definitely not like as easy as it sounds you know it's pretty hard to to get that kind of you know that magic little deal to happen right exactly and it is all those kind of deals are all star-based 
They're yeah, not artistic. Totally. They're not. They're not artistic based. They're not like. Oh, the you have almost really doesn't even idea. matter. <laughs> it, it means obviously because we've seen a lot of <laughs> Nick Cage movies, Bruce Willis movies. It just has to be like a, the right genre. It has to have like the right number of thrills. It has to feature the star enough, and it's like it's got to hit some some beats. But besides that, like yeah, it can be whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's that. I mean, I mean, I'm going to AFM this year. Are you going to AFM this year? Mm-mm. I'm gonna be at my AFM movie will be year. out there though um, with Multivision Air. So uh, if anyone's at oh, AFM nice. and looking for a uh, sci-fi for thriller a film. In, in, the, in the international <laughs> market, uh, yeah, we'll be out there on the booth. You know, Bug but, Sean. Uh, so uh, you know, Bob, I'm gonna be out there at AFM this year, and and every time I go to AFM, it's just you, you, it's an it's an absolute education for people to go out there because yeah, even if they have no movie, just to walk around to see how movies are yeah. sold. It it's is, crazy. Have you, but you have been there, right? You have I've been, been yeah, I went once and I tried, I was foolish enough to think that I could try to raise money for the alternate before <laughs> it was made at, at AFM. Yeah. And uh, I did like 20 pitches to all these different companies and everything. And they told me, all told me the same thing. It's like, oh, well, either if you have the budget or you have the cast or cast and half the budget, then we can talk. But if you don't have at least half the budget or cast or cast, and you know, then we're not, we don't care. There's not so even like, a conversation. It's not even a conversation and, to be had. And at that point, it's like, well, if I had cast and money, why would I even need you? <laughs> you know, I would just make the a- movie. <laughs> ex- exactly. Exactly. But, you know, I, I was talking to a client the other day who made a movie at the uh, sub hundred thousand dollar range. And yeah. they they made him and they came to me and they're like, what do you think? And I'm like, you're not going to make a dime. And mm. then they're like, well, what do I do? I'm like, uh recast one of the spot one of your parts with a name actor go out and wow. get somebody for a day for like 10 or 12, 10 or 15 grand and shoot it <laughs> shoot them out in a day pepper them out through the entire movie make sure there's enough of him in the movie or her in the movie and now you've got someone on a thumbnail and now you've got an opportunity to maybe make your money back but without that person you're you're dead in the water and i just yeah because it wasn't maybe. it wasn't a no, it's not a maybe. It's an absolute fact because of the well, not, kind not of in, not oh the kind of movie. Okay, yeah, that's the thing. It's it depends on the genre. So the genre of the film was not action. It wasn't. Uh, it okay. wasn't one of those genre. It, and it wasn't like an art house backyard film. So it wasn't like it, it didn't. Uh, it did. It didn't have a place to be. So I'm like, dude, the only way you're gonna even tr- even remotely have a shot is getting a face on on the thumbnail. Yeah. And he's exactly yeah. what he did. We worked and got a name actor. We also worked with a distributor and, and we went to the distributor and said, Hey, uh, give me a list of 10 people who you would be interested in this film If they were in it, we went through the list and we just started knocking them off and making offers until finally one said yes. And wow. we got him, shot him out in the day, peppered him throughout the entire movie. He's like, Oh my God, the movie's so much better. I'm like, yes, because you've got a real, like an actor who has real credits. Who's a real <laughs> professional has been doing wow. this for years. And now we're, going to go into the marketplace but there's a fighting chance at that right. and it's and it's sub hundred thousand it's sub hundred thousand yeah. so that's it's a good it's a good kind of place to be as a filmmaker yeah. is a sub hundred thousand because you start going 250 300 the, every every 10 grand that you go up you better just know your shit better <laughs> yeah no it's totally like keeping keeping your costs low it definitely helps the chance of recruitment for sure you know and i think like if you're self-distributing like if you can make oh, a movie yeah. for fifty thousand dollars, that's uh, you know a genre film, you know like an action thriller, horror, sci-fi, whatever. I think the chances of recouping on on fifty k, you know, especially if you're cutting out all the middle people, is really high. But you know, then you have to ask yourself like, what do you want to do with your life? Like, do, do you want to be you know promoting a movie and selling a movie for like two years? Like it's kind of, you know, but, but- some people are really into that, and some people like me, like don't really want to be like, I can, I can spend, you know, like a couple months promoting a movie, but like, I can't do it for a year. You know, that's just too much. <laughs> right. And, and that's the, and that's another, that's another thing that's really interesting because before, you know, when you go to film school, they teach you how to make, you know, a hundred million dollar movie. Uh, and yeah. then, <laughs> that's what they, they, you know, they teach you to that. And like, and they tell you, you could do this, you could be the next Chris Nolan and that's fine. And you might be, but chances are you're not going to be because there's only <laughs> so many Chris Nolas in the world. Um, but I think that before there was a problem getting into the business because things were so expensive to make. Movies were expensive to make. Getting good high quality was expensive to make. But now that the the barrier to entry is so minimal, you could make. I mean, I made my last two features for sub ten thousand, 
and got yeah. one of them on got one of them on Hulu. The other one was sold inter- both of them were sold internationally, and I made my money back fairly quickly. But yeah. But the oh, well, ten thousand. That's or less. That's uh, you know, you know, I mean, that money got, back. <laughs> you it's got not a good that, chance. It, you've got a you have a much better chance with with you know one had more faces in it than the other one did. The other one had no stars in it, but it was basically experiments for me. It was just kind of like let's right. see what happens. And I was expressing myself as an artist and all that kind of good stuff. But I think the problem we have now is not that we can't make a movie. It's we can't get our movie seen. So if the filmmaker moving forward doesn't have some plan in place to get the movie in in front of eyeballs to get into. And that's why I wrote my book about, you know, finding a niche, focusing on that niche and trying to build product or build films for that niche to get in front of the audience. Either you do it yourself, which I agree with you. Not everybody's got that that thing in them that they can yeah. go sell, sell, sell. I get that, but they need to have something in place, whether that right. be working with a PR firm, having a producer who's really good at partner with someone who's really good at it. And at the, I think the end is that maybe have a distributor and distributors that I know, and in my experience, they're trying to figure shit out too. Yeah. No, they're, <laughs> they're kind of them. in the same boat as we are, you know, they don't know what to do either. And they're trying to figure it all out. And I mean, I, I went to meetings at AFM during that whole distributor debacle when that went down. Oh, and I got, yeah. I, oh, my God. Yeah. And when I broke that story, I, you know, my face was all over the place. So all these distributors were bringing me in to like try to, you know, woo my apparent like two or 3,000 filmmakers I pulled together in a Facebook group that were pissed off at distributor. And they're like, oh, give us those films. And I'm like, uh huh. Okay. Yeah. I'll take the meeting. And I would ask them and they would just tell me their shtick. And, and I'm like, let me ask you a question. Do you, do you guys, you guys have any idea how you're going to make money back on these films? He goes, no, no, we just throw as many, (laughs) we throw as much shit against the wall as we can. And something usually sticks. And that was really eye opening to me when they said that, because it's just before there was a plan that before there was like, you went to a distributor, they had this, 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 and this, I can go do this. I get money from this, this, this. And that still does exist at the 5 million and above. The Nick Cage films, the, you know, 20 million and below that kind of genre stuff yeah, that still exists. But for the the hundred thousand and below 500,000 and below million and below, unless there's talent involved, it it's, it's very, very difficult for them to try to find a place in the marketplace. And then also for when your movie is done, there's about 3000 other films sitting, waiting to come in. So, yeah. They don't spend as much time on your films. Is that yeah. is that a fair statement? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I like when I was talking to my distributor for the alternate, like, you know, he he definitely had a little bit more care into his thoughts about it, you know. Right. And like he was like, you know, this this is a similar to a movie that we had a few years ago. We did really well with it. We think that this has a lot of potential to do the same kind of business, you know. And um, you know, he kind of like went in it with that way, and like they were very strategic of the way they were creating the art. I loved my art that I made. I thought it was beautiful. I have it on my, you know, frame poster over there. But like, you know, they're like all the distributors, like my, my international and the, the U.S. were like, this is just not going to work. You know, this is just, <laughs> it's not going to no. sell. And so then they made one, and then like suddenly that that's the one that everyone likes. That their own the trailer that the distributor made, uh, the U.S. distributor, then the international distributor is using that same poster, and I guess they're having a lot more success with it with that poster. So. It's just really interesting the way it all works and the whole the way the whole business works and like what is eye catching, what makes people click, you know, and the theories behind it. But again, in the end, like you said, no one really knows. We won't know if it worked until we see the first quarter, um, you know, numbers. Uh, I'd argue and, second and or third quarter like, numbers. <laughs> second or yeah, third maybe. Quarter yeah. Numbers. <laughs> Yeah. Because you, it's you know AFM's coming up, and then hopefully Can will come up after that, and those will be the two big markets that they they go to sell your film at. But right. it, it's you just don't know, and and that's the other thing you said. Very, you said something that's really important for people listening to understand. One, the the poster that made them click, that is something yeah. that needs to be in the head of filmmakers because there's still this magical dreamlike thing with theatrical. And yeah. all that, and that's wonderful. And we all grew, you know, many of us grew up with the theatrical experience and I want my movie in a movie, everything, every filmmaker wants their movie in a theater because it's yeah. it's the ultimate experience of it. But unfortunately, unless you're Chris Nolan, <laughs> right. you don't have the, the juice to do that all the time. So you're going to live on a thumbnail. 
Yeah, not even it's not poster. even the best. It's, it's not even not the best poster. thing for your movie. You know, like exactly. if you make a movie under a million dollars, like you probably don't want to put the movie into theaters because you're just going to lose all this money um, paying for that and like the, the, the like the the loss that you're going to get from the from the theater owners or whatever. And then, you know, in the end, it's like you're taking taking away juice, as you like to say, from the uh, you know the online sales because that's where you're really going to get your money. But if it's like split between a theatrical and uh you know the online like then you're not going to make as much money online and you know like that's where your real money i think is going to come in so i just feel like the theatrical is like a really beautiful thing and if the distributor wants to do it and they can make it work or whatever like totally great like let's do it but like you know i wouldn't push it <laughs> as a filmmaker i would let the the people who know what makes money and what doesn't make money make those decisions you know if they think that theatrical runs good for your movie and you're actually going to see some some extra revenue from it then great but I just don't think that's the 90% of, you know, movies in, at this budget level, you know. And and isn't it interesting, though, that, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, our films had a, 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 a movie you would be able to either buy it for 20 bucks on DVD or VHS or, or you would get someone would have bought it and then other people rent it. Then when TVOD showed up on um, iTunes showed up, then you got $3.99 for your movie mm-hmm. and nine ninety nine for your movie. That was your value of your movie per customer. Right. Was that right uh, before, obviously before that theatrical, you know, there was a ticket sale and you would get a split of the ticket sales. And that was the value of your movie where in today's world, the Netflixing, the Netflix effect and the Amazon prime effect has now brought our, our product down to less than a penny for review. And that's yeah. what the value in the marketplace is for our films without a major star or something that brings it up or niche or, you know, word of mouth or festival that maybe gives it some sort of juice. But what do you, what do you think of that? I I think that's why it behooves you to keep your movie on for sale or rent as long as possible and like not go to prime, not go to these other, um, you know, avenues until you've really exhausted your sales um, through rentals and in, you know, digital sales, you know, or, or if you have a DVD or your DVD sales, you know, um, but I feel like a lot of people, I, I see this even with people who are doing self-distribution, they just want the movie to be out so people can see it. So they can like say, oh, just click, it's on Prime Video, just click. So they, they just upload it to Prime and they get it out quickly. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. If you made a movie for even a thousand dollars, like don't just put it on Prime, like make your friends and family or your network rent it or buy it. And then suddenly you're going to get that thousand dollars back, you know? Um, but if you just put it on an app, like you said, you're never going to get not even a thousand dollars. So you're never gonna get a thousand dollars back on Amazon Prime. I mean, maybe after like five years. You know? Not I even. Not like, even. I mean, it's know? literally. It's it's literally. They're trying to get fractions of a penny now. Like they got down to a penny, and they're figuring out if yeah. they can do fractions of a penny for oh for certain for certain films. But the 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 place that I've seen and I've uh, I've been talking about for a while now is Avod. Avod seems to be the place yeah. where there is money still to be made. And even more so, the next level of Avod and something that people, the filmmakers are really like, their egos get really twisted in a knot because of this, is YouTube. If you yeah. can get on these YouTube movie channels that have a million, two million, five million subscribers and get a piece of that ad revenue, which is, YouTube is Avod. You know, it's not just right. Tubi and Pluto. It, it's and and Freebie. These are these are real places. I see the numbers from from distributors, and I'm like, wow, this is a pl-. but Avod is the place where yeah. I still make the most money off of my movies, yeah. um, and I think it's kind of where where the it's the hopefully the place where we can make the most money because at that point it's like someone clicks, and if your movie is good enough and it keeps them playing and watching you're going to get ad revenue. So it really yeah. is about how good your movie is. Have you heard the same thing in your world? Pretty much. Yeah. I feel like Avod is, is becoming like a, um, a real crown jewel for returns um, for, for films at our, at our level, you know, and some people even recommend like, just go straight to Avod. Like don't even spend time I, on, I uh, you know, the rental and the, and the sales. But like, I feel like, you know, for certain movies or just I guess certain distributors, like they still feel that that's a real, you know, great place to make, you know, a big chunk of revenue. So they still want the six months or whatever, a year or however long it is Oof. like doing, you know, those sales and then go to Avod afterwards, you know? 
It's really interesting with the whole TVOD thing because everybody I talk to, everybody I talk to, nobody makes money on TVOD unless you can drive mm -hmm. traffic, unless you can yeah. drive traffic. And most distributors don't understand how to drive traffic. So to hold it for six months in, in TVOD is, I feel, an, I mean, unless the numbers are coming in, you're like, oh, shit. But TVOD is just because it's up on iTunes and up on Amazon Prime, uh, Amazon to purchase or rent. Unless you can yeah, drive traffic, no and all those yeah. other places and YouTube if, and whatnot, you know. and Fandango and all that stuff. Which, eh. you know, if, you, if you get five cents from Fandango, and you know, you, you'd be amazed. But it's I, I've talked to so many distributors now who are just like, I just want to go to Avon, and the filmmakers are freaking out, and they yeah. go, they just don't understand that that's where the money is, and if you could drive all the traffic from the beginning to Avon, you'll make more money than you will letting it sit on TVOD because. Mm. Unless you can drive track. Look, I had I had a success story, a film entrepreneur success story, uh, Mark Toya, who made a million dollar robot, you know, action movie in this, in, which sounds horrible in the in oh, the jungle. Sounds great to me. I love right. those kinds of movies. <laughs> but that movie. But the reason why that works is because the, the visual effects were on par with anything that the Marvel, that Marvel Studios has ever put out. It's oh, wow. so good. I can't express to you how good it is. So he got a he had a he had a over a million dollar deal with a distributor, and he just looked at the contract. He's like, I'm never going to get my money up front. Mm. By the way, it was it was a million something up front, mm. and he's and he's like, I'm never going to make my money with the way this contract's laid out. Screw it, I'm just going to self distribute, mm. and he self distributed the whole thing, and he's made I think at six six or seven million dollars at this point. He made wow. all his money he made all his money back of the budget in three months on TVOD. But he ran Facebook ads. He ran YouTube ads. He understood. He was that PR firm that you're talking right, about right. because he comes from a commercial background and he enjoyed it and it worked fine for him. But it is possible in today's world. And he's still making yeah. money. He's still making money. He's like, yeah, I'm going to release another one. I'm going to I'm going to put another TVOD campaign out. And I'm just and he's still go while he's and I don't think he's gone to. I don't think he's gone to Avod yet. I think he's I th he might have gone to yeah, he did go to Avod on Prime. Yeah, he did do Prime. And he but he's like, Alex, I was making I think he said like 30,000 a month wow. on Avod and he was a billion minutes stream. Wow. Wow. And he's like, this is ridiculous. Why am I getting such little money for so much Amazon is getting? So it's just like but this is wow. the world that we live in, man. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if he, because that was on Prime, right? You know, getting that, Which that one? kind of the the one where it's like you know he was getting billions of view, minutes viewed and then getting thirty thousand dollars back. That was Amazon Prime. Yeah, but then he took. By the way, he took it off Amazon Prime. He's like, screw this, okay. and I'll just. He's yeah, done. Yeah. He's, so he won't. He's not doing any Avod anymore right now. Uh, he might go into the Tubies. I, 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 yeah, because I was wondering, like, what well, his Tubi numbers must be way better than that. You know, like if he was getting oh, a no. million minutes viewed on Tubi, he'd probably be getting lots and lots of money back. I, from that. I'm not sure, and I have to remember. I'm not sure if he's on Tubi already. Or he hasn't been on Tubi yet, but that film will be top ten on Tubi. It what's was it, number what's it called Monsters of Man. Okay, I'll have to look at Monster, check it out. Monsters of Man. Yeah, I, I have two interviews with him. The first one was us discussing him going on this adventure to do a million dollar self distribution experiment because he didn't give a care. Wow. He didn't care about the money. And he's like, I screw it. I don't care. And then two and a half years later, he comes back and he's like, Yeah, made about six, seven million dollars with this. And I'm wow. still going. Thank you. For, thank you for your book, Alex. I'm like, Oh, wow. Jesus. All right. So, so it, there is. That was a wonderful a case. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a it huge is. return. <laughs> but it is a huge return. But he even told me, he's like, I go, is it going to be a sequel? He goes, probably not, because this is not a real business. Because he, he comes from the commercial world. So he's been doing commercials for 30 years. And he goes, "That's you know, he goes, Alex, I make more money on my stock footage <laughs> than I do <laughs> doing this stuff because it's that's a real business. And right. I was like, wow. And he's a businessman and he's, you know, owns real estate and other things like that. So it's really interesting to see. And he, and by the way, he's been offered, he's been talking to all the big, I mean, I, I, he mm -hmm. won't say who, but we all know uh, there's probably a superhero company or two that's talked to him already. Uh -huh. And nice. he's, and he's because what he was able to do, he was top. I think when he went on, t on, on iTunes, he was like number two. I think, I think end game oh, was wow. the only thing ahead of him. Like oh, he wow. just, he just and people are like, who the hell is this guy? Where did he come from? Why does this look so good? He did this for how much? 
Wow. Shot, shot him all on reds. He's like had three or four reds with him and shot it all wow. up in the jungles of the Philippines and stuff like that. And wow. it's never, never built a set, never built a set, everything location. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. These are all great. These are great stories, but th- that's an anomaly. You know, you're well, talking about it. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of brings me to like my overall point about independent filmmaking is like, you're not, you're not really doing it for the money, right? You're doing it because you want to make movies and because you have stories to tell and you, this is, this is the thing that you want to do with your life. And and I don't think you even think you're doing it to like necessarily start this career. That's going to be your main thing forever. I mean, we all hope that's what it ends up being. And we all hope that we get to that level. But I think if you're going out to make an independent film, like you should be just thinking about it as like, you're creating this piece of art that you need to create because you are an artist and you're a filmmaker and you have the story that you have to tell and share with the world and that you want people to see, but like putting any more weight behind this than that, I think you're just going to be let down. Cause like, if you're, if you're, if you're going into it, like trying to make a bunch of money or even oh. getting a, a return on your investment or, right. you know, you know, getting an agent or a manager or starting your career where you're going to like start directing television or I'm going to get offers from Marvel or whatever, like all those kinds of things. Like, you know, that's all pipe dream stuff. And I think like if, if you go into making your movie with those sort of pipe dreams and that's like your expectation, there's nowhere that you can go, but down, like you're only going to be let down from the experience. But if you go into it thinking like, I have this movie I want to make, I'm really excited about it. I love the story. Like, I really want to get this out to show people. I want my movie to, you know, hopefully inspire someone else to make their movie or like inspire them to think about my characters or my story or whatever it is. If you go into it with that, like you're more than likely going to enjoy the experience because you're probably going to hear from at least one or two people who connected with your movie once you finally finish it and release it, you know? And so I think those are the kinds of reasons we should be going into making a movie. Like we should be focusing on the art itself, like not the outcomes of the art, which are completely out of our control, you know? That's what I did with my first two movies. I did the exact same thing. I finally, because most of my career, I was under that delusion of like this short film is going to blow me up or this thing is the thing that's going to take me to the next level. Like, we, yeah, that was we it. all have that, right? We, right, right. So then I I finally just, I went, I'm like, I'm just going to go make a movie. 30, 30 days later, I was shooting my movie after the moment I said, I'm going to go make a movie. And then that's the one that gets sold to Hulu and that's the one that gets sold internationally. Wow. And then I shoot that other one at Sundance for four days and, yeah. you know, and and just go and just make a movie. I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen with it. I, as I was flying home, I was like, I don't know if I have a movie. Like, I didn't have time <laughs> to see if I shot all the footage I needed. I don't know. I think <laughs> I did, you know, things like that. So it's kind of like this. Um, I When I let go of the outcome, man, it became much easier, much more fun to make yeah. movies. But let me ask you this, then why? And I know you've met a lot of filmmakers. And I know you are one as well as I. Why is there so much delusion in this profession? I mean, cookie makers <sighs> don't have this delusion. Like, I'm yeah. going to make the greatest <laughs> cookie ever. Like, it generally doesn't. It doesn't work in other, <laughs> right? Like, architects are like, I'm going to make the biggest biggest ever. Think of Frank Lloyd. Who? I'm the one. Like, you don't. You don't say, I'm sure they do, those people exist. I think, but I think architects is, may be a little closer than cookie makers, but uh, but yeah. But, but but generally speaking, it's not. It's not the, the infestation in the entire populace of that 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 group of of artists is not as delusional as filmmakers and screenwriters for that matter because they, it, right. what is it about this art form painters aren't that musicians maybe but again there's not there's not that it's just i find such a delusion in what we do with so many people so why do you think that I kind of feel like it's embedded in the art form in a lot of ways, you know, like if if you look at like, just think of like the classic phrase, like, I'm going to make you a star kid. You know, it's like, this has been going on since the beginning of cinema. Like this whole idea that like you can be a star on the stage and the screen, you know? And so I think when you're going into making your movie, it's kind of natural to think like, yes, like I could be the next Robert Rodriguez. Like he did it. He scrapped his movie together for $7,000 or whatever. And like, now he's a big star. Like I could be like Robert Rodriguez or Quentin Tarantino or like, you know, all these like complete like uh, outliers in the industry. And it's like, you just, you know, you, you fall in love with these movies and with these artists. And then you kind of like, you know, start to see like, oh, I could be like that. Like that could be me, you know? And you sort of see, your idea of your movie and your art getting to that level. And so I think it's just sort of a natural progression, but I think 
you know, it's, it's obviously completely misguided. And, and I think it's into some way it's almost sold to us, you know, like, like, oh, like 100%. by the filmmakers, by the by films Hollywood. themselves, by Hollywood. by Hollywood. It's like this, like really enticing, like, yeah, come out to Hollywood and make your fortune. You know, it's like, you know, it's like this whole like sort of thing. And I think, you know, you, you got to look at, and like maybe back, you know, in the eighties, in the nineties, like it was much more likely that that could work out for you in that way. But less now, competition, less competition, yeah. different marketplace. Absolutely. I know every month Completely there was different a new marketplace. Yeah. Every, every, in the nineties, every month there was a Richard Linklater, a Spike Lee, a John Singleton, a Robert Rodriguez, a Tarantino, a yeah. Kevin Smith. A, I mean, I could just keep the list keeps going on and on of every, almost every month there was one of these magical stories, Napoleon Dynamite, yeah. Joe Carnahan. I mean, it was just constant in the nineties. Uh, it was more events. lucrative back then too, like with Which, the DHS marketplace, you know, and then DVD, marketplace. The DVD marketplace. Like I think those two kind of led into each other. And like, it, it was a way that people could, you could make a movie for, for zero money and you could make a, a, a big profit, you know, like, and you, obviously movies cost a lot more back then. So it couldn't be zero, but like you could make a movie for like, whatever, half a million dollars, a million dollars or something. And then like, you know, get a big profit back. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just not the same anymore. Like, you know, like, like it's like the whole Napster effect of everything. It's affected films. It's affected everything. You know, all art form is suffering for it. And I think like now you, you basically, you can't get that big of a return on a movie so easily. It's like, it's, it's much, much more difficult. And I think going into it, like as a filmmaker, you should just be aware like of what you're up against and that like, these fantastical fantasy outcomes are like so so unlikely that they should not at all be embedded in your 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 hopes and dreams for the success of your movie like you should definitely try to like like it's good to have dreams it's good to have fantasies but i think it's good, it's good to separate them from the art you're creating because like you don't want it to be entangled because then you're just going to think that your art sucks if you're not famous after you make it <laughs> right and then you go into a depression and then you just are figuring it out and all this kind of stuff but isn't it fa fascinating that i know a lot of people listening to us right now are saying that's for everybody else that's not going to be me yeah <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Am I wrong? How many people listening right now have that thought in their head? Like that's for yeah. other people. That doesn't, that's not me. And well, I'm going to be guy. the one that's different. <laughs> but dude, I said the same thing. You said the same thing. I'm sure yeah. like, I'm, we all, we all go through this process and only after years of being battle hardened by the business. And by the way, all of those stories that we're talking about, the Roberts and the, and the Quintons and the Kevin Smiths and all of that stuff, I've had a lot of those guys on the show and I've talked to them about their struggles at the beginning and it, they, it was real for them at the beginning yeah. too. Yeah. They had success, but there was no guarantee for that success. And by the way, the one common, the one common uh, thing that I've gotten from all of those kind of like those nineties filmmakers I've had a pleasure of talking to is none of them had an outcome that they had in mind. None of them. Mm. None. Of, Robert wanted to go to the straight video market. That was yeah. it. That's all he cared about. Yeah, he Kevin saw Smith. like a business. Yeah, he saw that business um, opportunity. Yeah. Right. That was it. He wasn't expecting to get signed by Sony and and get it. Yeah. And he didn't even want El Mariachi to be released. He's like, no, 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 no. That was just an. Ex I was gonna go straight to video. I didn't. No, that's not my first movie. <laughs> he was freaking out about it, and like and something like what Ed Burns did with Brothers McMullen where he was working as a PA at ET uh, entertainment tonight. <laughs> and they had Robert Redford showed up to do press for quiz show. And in the elevator, as the doors are closing, Edward comes in, hands him a VHS copy of brothers McMullen's rough cut <laughs> here. This is my movie, Robert, please take a look at it. Three months later, gets a call from Sundance. Yeah. Robert gave us a VHS. How, how's that movie coming along? Is, is it almost done? <laughs> How can you plan that? That's, that's but so that was crazy. a different, that, isn't that insane? Like you hear these kind of stories, you're just like, but that's the stuff that feeds the delusion. I think it right. just, it's, we all like how many people listening right now have to put together a, a business plan? Probably not a lot, but the people who have put together a business plan to raise money <laughs> are using these as references of how m movies are made. Blair Witch Project, mm -hmm. <laughs> Paranormal Activity, Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah. Like they're using the, the, the you're outliers. gonna take the outliers <laughs> off your you can't decks, do people. That. <laughs> you can't do it, but that's every time I've read a, a business proposal, if it's a horror movie, 
absolutely Blair Witch and, 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 and Paranormal Activity are there. Yeah. And Saw. And Saw is yeah. there. Like, you you got to take those out. You got to like look at the movies that are like, you know, not the ones that, you know, completely exceeded expectations and blew up and were special movies of the moment or, or whatever, you know, like. Like, look at like, I don't know, like when I, when I was making my deck for the alternate, I looked at this movie called Spring. I don't know if you've seen Spring, but um, mm-hmm. it's like the sci-fi uh, thriller that was made for, you know, right around the same budget as my movie. It did get to Sunday and uh, not Sunday and South by Southwest, I believe. And, it, you know, it did really well. I think it was an XYZ movie. Um, mm-hmm. But like, those are the kinds of movies I was looking at, like ones that Good. were made around for the same budget as mine you know, didn't have stars, like you know, mine was going to have stars and like try to find those movies that look like your movie, but like, don't put a movie in there that doesn't look like your movie, because then you're, you're instantly going to dis, dis, you know, displease and, dis, and mislead even your investors to, you know, thinking that, you know, you're going to get something that you, you can never deliver, you know? Now let's talk about your new movie, The Alternate. How, how long did this film get, uh, just was just dating, sir, to get made? Well, so yeah, I wrote the first draft in like, um, I believe it was March of 2014. So what's that like over eight years until like, got this released. is the insanity. Uh, this is the insanity that we live in as artists. It, it, t- <laughs> it takes a long time. It takes a long time. I mean, and, you know, and I, and I went to AFM to, to try to sell it or to raise money for it in 2017. And so basically from 2017 till we shot in uh, 20, the end of 2019, that was like when I was like actively working on it and like trying to get it made, you know, I mean, I was still working on it that whole other time, but it was more like just trying to figure things out and, you know, rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and, you know, failing at raising money over and over again. But then 2017 is when I raised my first amount of money and then like met my producer, you know, raised more money and then eventually, you know, got it made a couple of years later. Um, so yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. It's been, it's been a while. Right. Um, I always love asking this question of filmmakers. What was the, you know, as a director, there's always that day that the entire world comes crashing down around you. And that's generally every day, but, uh, but what was the worst one on this day? What was the worst like moment in the production and how did you overcome it? Yeah, I, I think it was the second day maybe of the shoot. Um, and we were setting up the basement office set for Jake. He's got this, you know, really cruddy office that he does his editing in. He's a filmmaker, um, sort of like autobiographical in some way. And, I was uh, I was about to say, I was about to say. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a big beard, you know, come on, like whatever. Um, so uh, yeah, it was, uh, I was in charge of the office because I was, I had all, I was using my own computers as Jake's computers uh, in the office scene. So I was the one who was, you know, entrusted to, you know, make sure the computers were working and make sure that everything on the screen that needed to be, you know, on the screen was on the screen. And I was having all these issues um, just trying to get it set up. We were like way behind, like three hours behind on the second day in the office. And I had to like go and like at lunch, I had to like buy a hard drive and like go pay, like, like, get some money to pay somebody like I, cause I'm a producer too. So I had to like go to the bank, get like a large amount of money and like buy a hard drive and like get back. That was like during lunch and then get back in a half hour, 45 minutes or whatever to like, you know, direct and then somehow eat at some point. And I was just so upset, man. Oh my God. And I, I recorded audio logs um, while I was making the movie. So like on, on my podcast, making movies is hard. You can actually hear uh, the log of me, like on my lunch break, like talking to the phone and just like freaking out <laughs> about how everything is going wrong um, and how we overcame it. I think I got back to the set after, after getting those things. I just talked to my DP. I talked to my production designer and we were just like, look, we're just going to do, we're just going to, these are the scenes that we're going to be able to do today. This is what we're going to do. We're going to revise the schedule. I talked talk to my AD obviously. And we just like sort of broke down how we were going to solve it. We got through the day. I don't think we went over if we did, it wasn't much. And then, you know, we kind of had, had to replan the rest of the week uh, to make it work. And I think that was when we added another day to production because <laughs> we were supposed to be out of the office in three days. And I think we ended up shooting in the office scene for four because we just had too much we had to do in there. Um, but yeah, I think the way I overcame it was just like having these conversations with my team, um, mm-hmm. breathing, slowing down, and then just, you know, looking at the schedule and then just like going, just checking off things that we don't have time to do, moving them to another day and, and, and making the movie, man. And, you know, it, it ended up working out. Now going with the theme of what the alternate is about, which is kind of like alternate universes and the multiverse and that kind of thing. Right. 
what would you, if you had an opportunity to go back and talk to your younger self and just for one thing you could tell him and go, okay, dude, this is going to be the trip about your filmmaking career. What is that one thing you wish you would have known at the beginning of your career that was really difficult for you to learn along the way? Um, that, that you really just like, you don't need anything special. Like you don't need any like special person or special tip or there's, there's nothing that you can learn that's going to open up the doors and like, you know, make you able to make your movie. Like you just have to make your movie, you know? And I think like, once I made the feature, it was sort of like, this is just like making a short, but like, you know, 100 Longer. times harder, you know, it's just like, you know, and it's not like, you know, shorts 10 minutes and the movie's 100 minutes. It's not like 10 times. It's it's literally 100 times harder to make a feature. Um, but I think if I just had known that you just have to do it yourself and then the same thing that I did to make my short is the same, it's the same exact process I'd have to do to make my feature. If I just knew that and I, and I knew that I didn't need any special, you know, sign of approval or you know, manager or agent or big production company or like big check from an investor or whatever. If I, if I knew that it wasn't about that and it was just about doing the same thing I've been doing, I think I might've been able to make the feature a little bit sooner if I had that kind of, that kind of knowledge and confirmation that it's just like, you just need to do it, you know? Amen, brother. Preach, baby, preach. You know, <laughs> I, th I think so many of us always wait for permission too they permission from permission. somebody yeah, yeah from somebody yeah. To, to make it and you i think i got caught up in that same thing that's why i was like i was waiting for permission for 40 years and i just said <laughs> screw it i'm just gonna go make my movie the way i want to go make it and i'm just gonna grab a camera and grab some friends and make a movie and and boy it worked out you know thank god it worked out but yeah we are i think that's also built into the system is like hey you could be a star kid but you need my permission first yeah uh, exactly and that's kind of in the in the DNA of us as well, where now we're trying to just like, no, you can, you can go and do it yourself and you can, you can just get out there's, there yourself. There's, there's nothing stopping you, you know, like no matter who you are, or where you are, like the, you have the ability to go make your movie. You just need to to buckle down and do it, you know, so. and to be smart and to be smart about it. Don't go and make a, you know, a hundred, a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand dollar period drama piece with no stars in it. Please, Expect to make please. your money back. Please <laughs> like, don't do that. Make a no. genre movie. I mean, I, I just happen to love genre movies and that's all I want yeah. to make, you know? So like, yeah. that's what I do. But uh, yeah, I'd say like for your first feature, if, if you make it a genre movie, you're going to have way better chance at uh, success than if you go with any other genre, like genre drama or even comedy. Comedies are hard, man. You know, um, comedies and dramas are, are, are just, just walk around AFM and tell me <laughs> how many comedies and dramas not family films not faith no, family based. films faith-based and family yeah different yeah. different conversation why because they're focused on a niche you know yeah. throw dean kane in and have a puppy save christmas and you've got a movie that's gonna sell <laughs> mm -hmm. you got it made man i mean the dog that saves christmas movie i've, I've said it so many times on the show make a dog that saves christmas movie you'll sell it <laughs> yeah no, no kidding. I feel like I've had a couple of filmmakers on who do faith based and family films. And yeah, yeah they're doing good. Let's just say that they're doing really good. <laughs> they, they do well because it's an it's an audience that not a lot of filmmakers focus on and they need content. That's one area that doesn't have a lot of content. Family films, believe it or not, not a lot of content, even romance, yeah. com like romantic comedies. Hallmark has that kind of covered. But in, yeah. In, it's just tough, man. It is tough. So the the the, the go tos are always action thrillers, uh, and sci fi, and yeah. on a lesser extent, uh, horror, obviously. But there's just so much horror. Yeah, it's oh, it's because it's so easy to do a horror movie. Like that's, I mean, yeah. in, in the sense of production, not making a good horror movie, but just in the sense of production. Anybody can go get a monster mask, go in the forest, kill a bunch of teenagers, and then you got a horror movie uh, or, or a scary <laughs> movie in the house or something like that. And believe me, I've seen that movie um, too many times. To, yeah. Too many times that I, I'd the, rather the not. The thing that's so funny is there's a really good version of that movie that everybody's going to want to watch a billion times, but there's also yep. like a thousand bad versions of that movie too. So Ex be careful, Ex people. Exactly. Look, there's Jaws and there's Sharknado. Uh, and <laughs> I don't know how many times I'm going to watch Sharknado, 
I've never seen it. <laughs> I think I've seen clips but, of it. But just think of the money, man. Sharknado. Woo boy. That was a success up on success. But it was, and by the way, it launched an entire genre of like, Pretty you know, much. the alligator <laughs> hurricane and yeah. like, you know, Velociraptor preacher, whatever that movie was. Yeah. And they just, they just started combining crazy things after Sharknado. But when you hear Sharknado, you're like, oh, yeah, I understand what that means. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, I get it. Tornadoes with sharks in them. Yeah, I got it. Got it. Done. Done. <laughs> but if you're going to watch a killer shark movie, which is the one you're going to watch again and again, it's Jaws. Yeah. You're Still holds, still holds to this day, even with the fake shark. It's still. I wonder. Holds. I wonder what our children will be saying about Jaws in in twenty years if they'll be like, "Yeah, Jaws is so fantastic," or if Jaws is going to die out with our generation. <laughs> I don't. Th- I don't. Man, Jaws is is a masterpiece in the sense it that really it's just. It's just. I think because we don't see the shark so often, and because that's the reason. If we saw a lot of shark, it would have it'd be dated. Yeah. But. That's one of those movies that you like it was in the 70s. There's a handful of 70s films that hold. There's a lot, but there's but like the ones that stick out, like in the especially in the genre range, there's not a lot of genre 70s films. There's great dramas. There's, you know, but like genre, Jaws, obviously Star Wars, movie like Rocky. Yeah. It, Rocky holds. It's Rocky's still, so good. So good. <laughs> you're you're a piece of the choir, man. These are like my favorite movies. <laughs> like, you, we, we, I mean, Alien, the, Alien, a, I mean, a, Alien is, I mean, Alien is Alien. I mean, but, but again, it was, it was done at such a high level at that time. Yeah. So yeah. Jaws is, is, is a masterpiece. It is an absolute masterpiece in, in horror and in, in thriller and, and, and what Steven was able to do in that film is, it, it will yeah. never be redone. It's just, but you think about like what he went, through to get oh. that movie made and like how many days they shot and like the whole month the whole oh, no, the no. shark oh. thing and it's like it's crazy man it's crazy no it was it was insane insane one day i'll have steven on the show and i'll yes, ask please <laughs> can, can i can i sit in the corner when you have steven on the show and, and listen in i would love, I'd I'm, love to do I'm, that. Sure, I'm sure everybody's gonna want to sit in the corner <laughs> I'm going to want to sit in the corner when I'm on the show one day. Um, so listen, bro, I'm going to ask you a few questions. To ask all my guests. Uh, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Um, yeah, just, just make your movie. And, and if it's a short, if you haven't made a short yet, make it, make a couple of shorts. If you've made a couple of shorts and you want to make a feature, go make a feature. Even if your heart is telling you, I need to make a feature. I haven't never made anything before in my life make the feature just go out and make whatever you your heart you'll is learn. telling you to make because that's what's going to be good and then that's what you'll learn from uh what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn whether in the film industry or in life um yeah i, I think that like you know you basically you don't need permission you know like we were talking about before that you just need to go do it do it with your team create your your, your network create your family to go help you make your movies because like you're not going to be able to do it on your own um so find those 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 collaborators and stick with them because uh they make all the difference and three of your favorite films of all time um goodfellas alien terminator solid solid list sir solid solid list i'd throw alien and aliens in there both because they're well, just both yeah. masterpieces <laughs> I, I i was gonna say alien and aliens i was like that's too late i gotta throw in another one in there that i love too so terminator yeah, first terminator First Terminator. Yeah. And, and Terminator 2 is also another masterpiece as well. Um, but uh, and, and where can people see uh, the alternate and uh, and also to find out what you're doing and, and the good work that you're doing? So if you go to my website, uh, www.alrickbrussell.com, you can find links to the alternate and all the places and everything. It's also it's on Amazon. It's on Apple TV, iTunes. It's on Voodoo, uh, pretty much any place that you can rent and buy a digital movie you'll be able to find um, the alternate. So go look for it and, you know, buy it, rent it and rate it, rate it wherever you can, you know, uh, Rotten Tomatoes, uh, you know, whatever, IMDb, Letterboxd, any of the places, uh, ratings would be great. And be honest, I don't, you know, I love a good one, but, you know, I want your honesty too. No, no, no honesty, just only good ones, please. I don't <laughs> care about honesty. I don't care about honesty. <laughs> 
Uh, oh yeah, and then we, I also have a podcast called Making Movies Is Hard. Uh, you can find us at makingmoviesishard.com. We are uh, only released one episode a week, unlike Alex, who can manage to release like <laughs> one thousand episodes every week. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you uh, if you love these kinds of podcasts, uh, you might like ours too. It's very. I highly recommend their podcast. It is. Uh, I've been a. I've been a guest on it uh, a few. I think a couple times, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, twice. Yeah. Uh, I'm. We're due. We're due for another one soon. I think we're gonna. We, we might be doing one. We might be doing something very special. We can't announce it yet. No, I can't say anything. Maybe no. something's happening Maybe in, something, in the near future. Yes, exactly. uh, but uh, but listen, Eller. I mean, thank you so much for coming on the show and 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 talking shop with me. And congrats. After this epic, long, almost 10 years, almost like what, eight years yeah, trying to get almost this almost nine years, made. almost nine now, <laughs> almost nine years getting this made. You finally, you finally gave birth <laughs> to this yes, baby indeed. of yours, but congratulations, brother. And thank you for all the hard work you do and, and helping filmmakers out there as well, my friend. Thanks, Alex. Thanks to you too. And yeah, love your show. And I love all the things you do and yeah. Uh, keep it going, man, because uh, if you're not around, I don't know what we would do. <laughs> <laughs>